Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the weekly video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I am the founder of Migraine Nation, and I have a history of chronic and daily migraine that began at the age of four. I am super excited to tell you that I am here today with Dr. Amelia Barrett. Hello, Dr. Barrett. How are you? Hello, everybody. I am so good. Thank you. So Dr. Barrett is a repeat guest. She has been on here a few times. Everyone loves her, so we brought her back. She is a board-certified neurologist and the creator of the Migraine Relief Code, which is an online course for people with migraine. Today, we're going to talk about fiber and migraine. So in general, we know that fiber is good for us, but a paper was just published in Frontiers in Nutrition that found an inverse association between fiber intake and severe headache and migraine. So this paper did not look for cause. In other words, it wasn't a randomized controlled trial, but it was able to find an association. And we'll talk about the limitations and the strengths of this paper later. But it was actually a very large study with over 12,000 participants from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which you may have often heard referred to as NHANES, excuse me. So we're going to talk about this data, but first, we're going to start by talking about what we do know about how fiber might work to help our migraine or our headache disorder. So Dr. Barrett, let's start by reminding everyone what fiber is, where and how we get it in our diet and why we need it. Love to. Yeah. So fiber is basically found in plant foods. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's not something we find in things like meat or dairy or, or products like that. This is found in all kinds of plant foods, fruits, mm -hmm. vegetables, grains, beans, legumes, like all the things that grow from the earth. And the fiber is actually the part of it that your body doesn't really digest. Mm -hmm. um, and so fiber is important for us, not because we digest it, but because the bacteria in our gut microbiome do. They love fiber. Like literally fiber is what's for dinner. That is what <laughs> the, the bacteria eat. Uh, so that is uh, where we get it and why we need it. Okay. So are there different types of fiber? Um, I know that I actually shared this article or some findings from this article and everyone was asking, which kind of fiber, et cetera, et cetera. So are there different types and what are they? Yep, there sure are. So uh, there are two main kinds of fiber, soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. And that just refers to whether or not they dissolve in water. So soluble mm -hmm. fiber will dissolve in water. It sort of makes a thick uh, substance. It's almost a little bit like a runny jello. That's what a mm -hmm. uh, soluble fiber is going to look like. And an insoluble fiber doesn't dissolve at all. Now, there's a lot of overlap here. A lot of plant foods have both soluble and insoluble. But just to give you sort of a run through, some of the more common causes of soluble fiber are things like potatoes, Brussels sprouts, oatmeal, flaxseed, nuts and beans, apples, blueberries. Those are all things that are known to be high in soluble fibers. Okay. On the other hand, insoluble mm -hmm. fibers um, don't dissolve in water and they are in um, vegetables that, that it's almost like they feel a little bit tougher. So think celery, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you can see how that stringy part of celery would be not that easy to digest. So um, there are lots of good places you can get insoluble fiber also. Um, again, those vegetables like celery, zucchini, the skins of root vegetables, legumes, lentils, wheat bran, whole grains, leafy vegetables. So lots of different places. And as you can see, all of these are plants and there is some overlap in terms of what kind of fiber you get from what. Okay. So is there any hypothesis on how fiber might affect a person's migraine frequency or severity? How is this association possible? 
Yeah, absolutely. And this is the one of the newer areas of functional medicine that is so exciting to me. Um, and the theory is that uh, when we have leaky gut, we have more inflammation in the body. So if you can imagine, uh, over here is the inside of your intestines and over on the other side is your uh, your bloodstream. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happens in leaky gut is that there is uh, the indigestible food particles get through a lining of mucus. And underneath that lining of mucus, there are some cells, one cell, just one cell thick. And on the other side of that one cell is a lot of immune cells. 70% of your immune system actually lives in your gut. So mm -hmm. if something leaks across that's not supposed to because of that damage, it will fire up your immune system. Now, when your immune system starts recognizing lots of strange particles that aren't supposed to be there, mm -hmm. that are only there because of this, you can think of it as damage inside your intestines. When your immune system starts recognizing all these things it doesn't normally see, it will make chemicals. Those chemicals then travel up to the brain and cause headaches. Those chemicals are part of what we call inflammation. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is one theory about um, why we need fiber. So let me take it one step further. This is the problem that I'm explaining mm -hmm. right now, that your immune system is reacting to these food particles. Now, right. here's how fiber helps fix that problem. So right. there are, we've all heard of the gut microbiome, right? Right. And so there are uh, good bacteria in your gut. And they are mm -hmm. the ones that like to eat fiber for dinner. Like I was saying, they will mm -hmm. actually digest that fiber and they make that mucus lining okay. that protects the underlying cells that prevents leaky gut, that reduces the chances that your immune system is going to react to those particles. So fiber is actually protective. Okay. So yeah. So those bacteria eat the fiber, they make this mucus layer, that's their day job. And then once that mucus layer is intact, it is no longer possible for those particles to uh, traverse across this leakiness in your gut and fire up your immune system. So it shuts down inflammation. Okay. So basically the fiber is good because we're feeding the good bacteria. We are not allowing these the immune cells to get all fired up, which then will cause the headaches to be worse. So I have a couple questions because I bet a lot of the migraine people out there who understand migraine disease and the genetics and the makeup that goes behind it are saying, well, I have a tendency toward migraine. Why are you telling me that my immune system or inflammation is causing it? So is it that the inflammation is making their tendency toward migraine worse or triggering uh, migraine in that instance. Yeah, exactly. So people can have leaky gut and not get migraines. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't have migraine genetics. Maybe they don't have half a dozen other things that are increasing their chances of migraine. But the studies are very clear that those chemicals that are released by the immune system, the cytokines, the interleukins, stimulate the endings of the trigeminal nerve in uh, the mm -hmm. head. And that is one of the main triggers for migraine. So that's the mechanism by which this works. And it's not the only mechanism. Most people mm -hmm. with severe migraines have well, at least half a dozen different things going on, right? Mm -hmm. Causing their headaches. And so this is just mm -hmm. one piece of the puzzle. Okay. So my next question is we discussed there's more than one type of fiber. Is there a difference in whether you're eating the soluble or insoluble fiber uh, when it comes to helping this problem? Uh, no, you can You need a mix of both. And in the study, okay. they actually did not distinguish soluble versus insoluble. Right. So it's kind of a relief. <laughs> because yeah. We don't have to get too wrapped up in like how many grams of which kinds of fiber we're trying to eat now. It's just, just get some fiber is really the big picture. Right. So uh, people who listen to the podcast a lot uh, probably have heard 
us talk about there's a difference in 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 studies so uh you the golden study would probably be a randomized clinical trial where we're looking for cause you want to know if a certain thing causes migraine or helps migraine and you give it to people uh, with a placebo etc and you can actually prove causation then there's other types of studies that don't prove causation but you can look for an association you could say these people have migraine these people don't and go back and see what they were exposed to so the study we're talking about today that was just recently published cannot prove cause because it's just an associative study it's just a study looking for correlation so even though uh we have dr barrett here to tell us how this can be associated etc it's great that we have this study that uh someone did look at it it can't prove cause but we're going to tell you all about it because it is pretty exciting that someone did study this because we don't have a lot of studies on migraine and diet so um dr barrett let's talk about what this study did find they went back they asked people uh if they had had um a severe migraine or headache i think in the last three months and then they looked at whether people said yes or no to that and then they looked at their fiber intake is essentially what happened so what exactly did this study show? Yeah, and I love this study. This is, I think this is absolutely fascinating research and mm -hmm. we're gonna see more of this in the future. So basically mm -hmm. what they found in this study is an association so that as fiber intake went up, risk of migraines in the last three months went down. Mm -hmm. Association, like you're saying, um, but it was it was fairly interesting. So for every... 10 grams of fiber per day that a person's intake went up, their chance of having had a, a migraine in the past three months decreased by 11%. So yeah. that's actually a pretty good um, association. I, I think that's really interesting because fiber intake is something we can control pretty easily. And I, right. I always think it's empowering to look at things that we control that can really change our health. Mm hmm. So the other difficulty sometimes with these types of studies is some weird things will pop up that we don't understand why. And that is part that's the other reason that you always need to do more research, more uh, robust trials to figure out uh, if these were just random things that popped up or to look into why they might pop up. So let's just make sure that we let people know that we don't know why this is but we need to report completely what the trial or what the research said and there were some uh random sections of patients in this trial who this data didn't apply to there were just a few races um that it didn't apply to and there were also some bmi categories and we don't know why so it didn't apply to everyone and we want to make that clear but the more studies as they are done um will hopefully elucidate uh whether it applies to everyone or the or, and maybe give us reasons if it doesn't apply to everyone is yeah, that true absolutely and i think that is a really good point to bring up yeah so um so let's see this part is actually a little bit funny so dr barrett and i because this study did focus on an increase of 10 grams of fiber um we were looking we were trying to give everyone examples of 10 grams of fiber and it wasn't as easy as we thought so dr barrett why don't you tell us some let's start with the easiest way to get 10 grams of fiber what would that be beans beans beans, beans are the easiest way to get more fiber um, right a, right yeah a cup of beans has 30 grams of fiber 30 uh -huh. grams that's like a lot. <laughs> yeah. And so, so go ahead. You know, I think you could just throw a couple of beans on your salad. You mm -hmm. could have beans as a side dish. You can mix it in with another grain. Um, once you start thinking about it, it's not that hard to find ways to include it. Um, I think the problem with this is that there are some people who just don't tolerate beans. Mm -hmm. So then we started looking at, you know, other popular ways that if you throughout your day add other things together that you can come up with 10 grams of fiber so what else can we do well um it seems like most things you do will that we think of as being high in fiber so for example oatmeal we think of that as being mm -hmm. high in fiber right 
Um, mm -hmm. A cup of oatmeal gives you about five grams of fiber. Um, okay. An apple gives you about five grams of fiber. Mm -hmm. A uh, potato gives you about five grams of fiber. And honestly, I didn't know potatoes had any redeeming features, but I'm so relieved now I can eat <laughs> potatoes. They've, they've got fiber. <laughs> so potatoes are back. <laughs> not in the form of French fries, but... <laughs> yeah, not potato chips, not French fries. Not potato French chips, fries. yeah. <laughs> we didn't look those up. Anyways, exactly. go ahead. Exactly. And you know, nuts have um, a little bit of fiber in them also. Um, thing, uh, whole grains, uh, quinoa, in addition to the brown rice, things like popcorn, um, seeds like chia, you know, so all of these plant uh, sources are great ways to get more fiber in your diet. You can also just take a fiber supplement. So for example, um, if you just want to get as much fiber as you can, and you don't tolerate beans, then the easy way to do that is just with a fiber supplement. Okay, so hopefully we've given everyone some practical applications of what we've talked about, uh, because that was what I noticed when this was being shared through the community is everyone was wondering exactly how to apply this idea to their lives. So I hope everyone has some ideas now. Um, so more research does need to be carried out, but I think that we have some ideas from Dr. Barrett about the physiology behind how fiber can actually uh, help our, our head, head pain, migraine, whatever type of head pain we're having. We do have a study now that shows that it could possibly make a difference. Okay, so. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Dr. Barrett? You know what? I think we covered the high points. We're good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, Dr. Barrett. And thank you everyone for joining us this week on the weekly video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. Please join us again next week. Bye-bye.